So I get the pleasure of introducing Raphael Perez and Cassandra Thompson to the SUNY Summit this year. They're going to present strategies for culturally responsive online teaching in STEM. And as Jen mentioned, if you have any questions for Raphael or Cassandra, please feel free to put them in the chat and they're going to address them at the end of their session. So I'm looking forward to hearing both of you. Please uh, take it away. All right. Well, my name is Cassandra Thompson and I would like to welcome all of you all to our presentation today on strategies for culturally responsive online teaching in STEM. And um, Rafael, do you wanna to move to the next slide? I have been an instructor for 12 years and I, um, I am a um, trained sociologist and but I also work in the STEM field because for six years I have been teaching both undergraduate students and graduate students statistics. And in my field, I use SPSSS and R to as a statistical program to help students learn apply statistics. And um and also I am a former member of CETO. That's how Raphael and I met. And Raphael, I will turn it over to you so you can introduce yourself. Thank you, Cassandra. Yes, uh, my name is Rafael Perez. Um, I'm a part of a faculty consultant of the Center of Excelling in Teaching and Learning at the Madison College. Uh, this is in Wisconsin. Um, and I would like to thank uh, Alex and Nancy for the invitation. Uh, we're very happy that you're here with us today uh, and we're happy to participate in this uh, presentation. I've uh, been able to participate in some of the uh, presentations earlier this week and they have been amazing. So thank you, uh, Alex, for this uh, opportunity. I'm also a physical science instructor. So that's uh, kind of like my background. Um, and I'm also uh, a faculty at the college. Uh, so I've been teaching earth science, geology and related laboratories uh, at Madison. So, um, and now I'm gonna let Cassandra provide an overview. So I just want to welcome all of you once again. So thank you for your time and thank you for joining us uh, in this afternoon. All right. Okay, well, um, well, once again, welcome to everyone and also thank you for the invitation. Well, first I'd like to talk about the overview of our presentation and what we will discuss today. Well, we've already introduced ourselves and we will define culturally responsive teaching. So you have an idea of what that concept means. Then we will go over and discuss the culturally responsive teaching online model. This is an expansion of other scholars work in the field, one in which Raphael and, and I um, created this new model to help you understand how you can bring culturally responsive teaching online, which we call the CRTOM model into your course. Raphael will give an example on earth sciences. We'll conclude and follow um, up with questions. All right, well, well I first like to begin with um, asking you a question. And Raphael, are we good to go on Mentimeter? Yes, it should be uh, up and running. So I'm gonna type in the direction on in the chat. So menti.com is the web page where you can uh, access that question that is on the screen. And we would like to create a word cloud. Uh, so what comes to what words come, come to mind when you hear the concepts culturally responsive teaching and STEM. Uh, so in order to access this word cloud, you can go into any web browser, uh, type in www.menti.com, M-E-N-T-I.com. And then you can enter the code 139851. And there's a space in between those numbers. You don't need to leave uh, those spaces. And once you uh, enter that page, you can go ahead and start sending your words 
and we're going to create the work cloud with those two uh, concepts. Raphael, can they make multiple submissions if they like? Yes. Okay. Oh, I see. It's taking into a, into a different question. Okay, hold on one second. <laughs> yeah, I just realized that. I was opening my presentation and noticed that. So thank you for letting me know. Yeah, we're trying a new uh, add-in into PowerPoint where basically you use a Mentimeter and you connect your Mentimeter presentation uh, with your PowerPoint. And for some reason was working earlier today and now of course it's not working when we need it. Uh, so if you can jump in into the chat and then for now enter your, uh, you know, your words, uh, you know, what do you think? What, what, what's the first word that comes to mind when you hear uh, culturally relevant and responsive teaching and STEM. Okay, I see diversity, equity, DEI, inclusion, inclusion. So we can see there's uh, some uh, common questions coming. Mm -hmm. All right, great, I see DEI. A lot of great answers. Okay. Mul multiple sources of knowledge, perspective. That's a good one. Perspective, gender, languages, and protocol, uh, community. And I missed some. I was trying to, for some reason, I'm still unable to get the Mentimeter to jump into the correct slide. So I apologize for that. It was working earlier today. We're trying new technology and you, you know how this sometimes this go. Uh, but this is in case that you're wondering, we're using uh, a tool called Mentimeter. You're probably familiar. It's a presentation tool that you can use to integrate, uh, you know, any uh, offline data that you, that you would like to collect from your students, or you can use it like in this case with an active presentation. Uh, so we'll, we'll take a look at at that and hopefully, you know, we can at least, we have three questions on Mentimeter. So Cassandra, at least we know that one is working. So we'll use, we'll take that one at the end. <laughs> <laughs> well, Alex um, wrote something in the chat and she says, I also think of bias as you don't often think of STEM and culturally responsive teaching. And that is so true. Um, mm -hmm. Being a instructor in the field, both Raphael and I, um, these aren't discussions that um, professionals or practitioners in the STEM field often have. Rafael, you want to move to the next slide? Absolutely. Uh, since the Menti one isn't working. Okay, great. All right. So, um, you know, one of the reasons why Rafael and I have a passion for this particular topic is because we are both practitioners in the field, and both of us have observed that students of color encounter barriers to achievement in STEM. And um, there is a very leaky pipeline in the STEM field for students of color. I, um, as an instructor in many of the intro to statistics classes that I've taught, I would have a number of students of color in the class, in the intro class. And, and when it came time for them to advance to the next level of statistics, one in which they are um, doing more um, um, correlation and regression and analysis and t-test, uh, I'm seeing fewer and fewer of those students of color advancing to the next level. And we all know that um, students of color 
they are just as capable of succeeding in the STEM field. So what, what can we as instructors do to help these students be successful in their field? Well, one of the areas that Raphael and I discussed was this Eurocentric instructional model. And this model is one in which the Eurocentric method of teaching is considered normative. And I'm a sociologist, so I'm going to fall back on my sociology um, teachings here. And this Eurocentric instructional model, it doesn't, um, you, it really doesn't take into account the cultural capital that students bring into the classroom. And what I mean by cultural capital, students bring into the class knowledge and a background and experience that we can tap into as instructors to help them learn the material. And rather than recognizing these very different cultural experiences that our students bring into our classroom, oftentimes the Eurocentric instructional model, it treats the classroom as this culture-free zone, one in which we do not consider this um, bank of knowledge that students have. And furthermore, we ignore the Eurocentric instructional, instructional model. It, it, it ignores cultural diversity as well. And, and so our CROTM model, what it, what it does is that it provides um, a guide for instructors to think, how can I motivate my students and and provide the and provide the doors of opportunities. So there's no longer the um that leaky pipeline in the STEM field. What can I do to bring more scholars of color into STEM? Next slide, please. Okay. All right. So the culturally responsive online teaching model. We work on work with adult student learners, and our primary goal is to uh, assist adult learners in succeeding. And so um, adult learners, what we do is we acknowledge their experiences. We, we, um, we use new information to build on their past experiences to help them learn the material. In addition to that, instructors are encouraged to revise their curriculum and make the content uh, meaningful. And by meaningful, I mean that what is it, what knowledge do you want students to gain in order for them to advance to the next unit. And, and oftentimes we, we don't make um, those connections to students. Why do I need to understand um, information about the mean? And, um, you, and, you know, and what I do is I share with my students, well, you really want to understand information on the mean because when we get to ANOVA, you're going to be lost. So it's important to make those connections to the students and tell them why they have to master a skill. Next slide. Culturally responsive online teaching model, it explores new theoretical frameworks and its application to online teaching practices. It examines the integration of strategies and it maximizes student learning in the online classroom, specifically for STEM courses.
Now, um, our CRTM goals um, are as follows. Number one, we want to maintain engagement in the classroom. We want students to acquire knowledge about the course content. The CRT, CROTM model goals is to develop the critical thinking skills of students. In addition to that, our goal is to promote a sense of belonging and community and also to assist students in succeeding in their academic and professional careers. Uh, just to provide you with a little history on the culturally responsive teaching, um, I would like to direct you to the work of Howard, um, his work of 2015. And, um, and Howard suggests that for, in order for culturally responsive teaching to work, it requires instructors to focus on the relational component. And, um, and so by the relational component, what the instructor is doing is he's engaging students from very diverse backgrounds. The instructor is also achieving learning at a higher level. Students can begin to learn course material at a deeper level. And in addition to that, they can respect students for who, the, for who they are. Um, what you have before you is a table and it's the work from Zaretta Ham Hammond. And this is from her scholarship. It is culturally responsive teaching and the brain. And what I like about this chart is um, Hammond um, explains the differences between the, um, the, tech, um, the different teaching techniques over the years. And, um, and much of the, um, the timeframes that I'm going to talk about, the timeframes are a little loose, but, uh, but I just want to give you a sense of where we started and where we are now um, in terms of teaching approaches. So in the 1980s and 90s, um, you know, the big fad was multicultural education. And with multicultural education, there was this focus on celebrating diversity. Um, here, many of the um, educational institutions, not just the instructors, they were emphasizing positive um, interactions between the college community or, or, the, um, or the community of learners. And the multicultural education, it focused on exposing privileged students to diverse literature and also including diverse literature in the curriculum. And then about a decade later, there was a movement towards social justice education. And, and under this particular educational movement, what you saw here was that there was a focus on exposing the socio-political narratives of marginalized groups. And um, the other objective was um, raising consciousness about social inequality in society. And there were concerns with how do we interrupt inequitable patterns in terms of educational outcomes. Now, one thing you will notice about the multicultural education and the social justice education model both of these models are more about movements, about um, inclusion, diversity, or about um, raising awareness 
on social inequality. Um, the emphasis on improving learning capacity for diverse students, that is very low on the hierarchy. Culturally responsive teaching, it emphasizes improving the learning capacity of marginalized students. And it focuses on cognitive aspects of teaching and learning. We are concerned with building an academic mindset as well as opposing dominant narratives about marginalized groups and their abilities to, to learn um, academic material, okay? All right. Uh, now, in 1995, Gloria Latson Billings, she introduced this theory of culturally relevant teaching. And um, she defined the de instructor as using the experience of diverse students as a pedagogical tool. And Latson Billings built this framework, this three legged um, framework. And, it, and she emphasizes academic success. Instructors do not have to lower standards in order to um, meet the goals or the learning objectives of their, of, of their courses. They can maintain high standards. In addition, Subjects concerning cultural competency can be introduced into the curriculum. And also this three-legged stool, it continues with the other models by including social awareness in order to challenge social inequality in society. And then later um, about 15 years later, we have scholarship from Geneva Gray, and she constructed the culturally responsive teaching model. And, and her primary points is that um, instructors should acquire data on the cultural practices of diverse students, of, of diverse student groups to enhance their learning. And um, instructors should discuss and create a positive learning environment, but continue to hold the line on maintaining high standards. And she also advised in, um, instructors to revise their core curriculum, their course curriculum, to promote equity in the classroom for all students. Now that we have reviewed uh, previous scholarship in the field, I'd like to introduce you to our culturally responsive online teaching model. The process to develop a CROTM model includes seven features. Number one, um, prejudice reduction. Number two, maintaining high academic standards the ability to facilitate knowledge during course delivery, integrating diverse experiences into the course curriculum, when necessary, calling attention to social equality, social inequality in the classroom. And one that's really important to me as, as a sociologist, and that is, creating a sense of community in your online classroom. If students feel socially connected, then they, then they are more likely to continue with the, um, with the course and be, and be motivated learners, learners. And also you want to introduce technology to aid knowledge construction 
and promote what I call interactional currency of diverse students in the online classroom. Now, interactional um, currency, that is a socioeconomic term, one in which um, you have students in the classroom, they are, they are, con they are contributors to the learning environment. I don't know how many of you have been in a situation where you might have a student of color in the classroom, but, um, but they are not participating. You know, um, based on private conversations with this student, that they have knowledge that would be useful to the entire classroom. And so it's working on that relationship and encouraging them to share what they know so the whole entire class can benefit from the knowledge that they have. And that's what I mean by interactional currency. All students, all instructors should promote students um, to have interactional currency in their online classes. Okay. Okay, so during this session, the presenters will describe the CRTM model and a theoretical application to a sample earth science lesson on water quality and groundwater contamination to make it culturally relevant. All yeah, right, so well, I will kick it over to Raphael. Thank you, Cassandra. Um, and thank you, Alex, for posting uh, some of the articles and information of some of the uh, work that has been done by Geneva Gate and some other uh, researchers that uh, Cassandra mentioned uh, during the first part of the presentation. Um, so today we would like to share some ideas and strategies uh, to create a culturally relevant lesson, uh, specifically in a STEM course. Uh, we will look at a water quality lesson in an earth science class and focus specifically uh, on the groundwater portion of the learning outcome. Okay? Um, the learning outcome is set by the institution, in this case, the Wisconsin Technical College System. Uh, in this lesson, uh, students will learn about the groundwater system, collaborate you know, to evaluate the quality of the groundwater at different locations of interest, uh, possible human impacts uh, and contaminations, and of course, discuss the significance of the groundwater resources in those areas. Um, in this lesson, uh, it includes textbook readings, uh, videos, scientific articles, online repositories, and a unit outline that includes guided questions, knowledge checkpoints, uh, to ensure that, that students have a good understanding of the concept discussed uh, in the unit. Um, and all of this information about the previous concepts is, uh, you know, is also included to bring a strong scaffolding uh, in the unit. Okay? Uh, as you might be aware, uh, most test books uh, and articles in, uh, in STEM, right, uh, specifically in, in geoscience, are written by white male authors, right? Um, this is something that we need to be aware of when we want to make a more culturally responsive learning experience. Uh, while selecting the readings, uh, search for options that include diverse authors and also that bring different cultural perspectives to allow students to see a representation of other ethnicities, gender and background in the field. Uh, we want to help break down those misconceptions that STEM is only for uh, white males. We'll talk more about that uh, later on. Um, so also as part of the materials, um, videos are included to provide a choice for students between reading the material or watching the video. So it's all about choices and we'll talk more about that as part of the universal design for, uh, for learners. Um, so we shall use different resources and techniques to connect with individual learning styles. Um, Personally, I like creating uh, or using short videos between 10, 15 minutes that cover the main topics. Uh, transcript with visual cues, screen tests, and scene description should be provided as well. Um, as you're aware, transcript and closed caption not just help students with disabilities, but in general, all students, right? Uh, for example, English as second language learners, 
uh, student with bandwidth issues uh, to download the videos. Uh, you know that some videos does consume a lot of data uh, nowadays, right? So we need to be aware of those uh, situations, uh, especially when students have limited access to internet. Um, a colleague, a colleague of mine, um, she recently shared that one of her adult students preferred the transcript because recently she had a baby, and the only time available to work on the class was late at night while the baby was sleeping, right? So there's multiple scenarios where transcripts are uh, beneficial. Right? Um, in addition, I like to include scientific articles uh, to expose students to current research or environmental concerns. Uh, you can highlight the terms and concepts that are being discussed in the lesson uh, for students to see the connection with the content, right? So you can using, you know, that scaffolding with the vocabulary will help them comprehend and gain interest in, in the topic. Um, and then lastly, uh, it is important to provide students with a clear explanation uh, of the assessments, the grading criteria, and the expectations in the course. Uh, for example, providing students with rubrics ahead of time, uh, guidelines to help them achieve the learning objectives and specific requirements, um, like replying to enters in the discussion boards, right? We want to have those meaningful uh, discussions. So sometimes we get students replying with very generic, uh, very generic uh, terms, right? Like uh, yes or no, I agree. Like good job. So we want to exp you know, help them expand the discussion and have something that is more meaningful and more significant. Uh, in our college specifically, we use a media tool called Yuya, uh, Y U J A. I'm not sure if you are using that tool in your college. Uh, it's basically a media management site that allows you to create videos um, or you can upload videos and then you can add inline quizzes that could be used as formative assessment. But there's another, uh, you know, another piece of information that is very useful is that it provides the option to allow a self checkpoint. So when you're creating your videos, you can add a, a reflection point and the student decides whether they're ready to move on with the video or they can go back into a specific section of the video. Um, the video you know, will be paused until they're ready to move on. And then you can add a prompt uh, for the student to self-reflect on how you know, her experiences interse intersect with the content, right? Um, and then we can connect that information with the journal, uh, journal or the discussion board to allow the students to share their voice and experiences with the rest of the group. Okay, so self-reflection, I think that would be uh, a very important component, right? So, <clears throat> so the first uh, step in, the, in this uh, model that we're proposing, so uh, we need to take active steps to reduce prejudice. Uh, those preconceived opinions based on someone's gender, ethnicity, religion, uh, language, or any other personal or unique characteristics, right? Uh, so prejudice, including uh, different stereotype beliefs, can prevent people, you know, from getting to know each other, uh, you know, knowing that they're that they're different, right? Uh, and subsequently, this will prevent deeper and meaningful uh, relationships or conversations, right? Uh, we need to build trust uh, with our students. Uh, we need to open up and share some of our vulnerabilities. Uh, this way, we can feel more comfortable. Uh, well, the students, sorry, will feel more comfortable reaching out. Uh, uh, to us and communicating their needs, their struggles, and their success, right? Uh, people of color, mainly African-Americans, have a lower uh, general trust uh, than most other racial uh, and ethnic groups. Uh, this was cited from uh, Eager et al. 2013, right? So we need to be aware to build that trust, right? That will help to also get a stronger uh, community in the online classroom. So um, in the online environment, this might be a bit more challenging, um, but we could reach out to students with personalized messages, like, you know, for example, using information that they have previously shared with us, like in the journals or in the group introduction to show a genuine care and empathy in our uh, communication. Um, so one step to reduce prejudice in the classroom is to recognize our own biases. Uh, be aware of unwillingly communicating uh, negative messages um, for students that could potentially affect their interest uh, and motivation in the course uh, and on the, on the field itself. So some of the common bias uh, in STEM are gender-based, 
So men only in STEM or trait based, like STEM is only for straight A students, right? Um, another example of bias happens when uh, teachers unintentionally call out students uh, based on their gender, uh, their identity or race. Uh, like for example, calling out males for a discussion on a certain uh, uncertain topic. Right? Uh, you probably remember uh, Dr. Kevin Kelly uh, mentioned on his presentation on Tuesday that there's also uh, interaction bias uh, in the online classroom. And he cited uh, a paper from an article from Baker et al, 2018. So based on student names alone, I'm using a quote, right? So based on student names alone, uh, online teachers are 98, 94% more likely to reply to white male students than to other students, right? So, um, and then Dr. Kelly on Tuesday section, he provided some suggestions, right? On how we as instructors can make sure that we're not kind of like going into that interaction bias. And he provided one idea uh, and, you know, I will highly recommend you to go back and watch uh, the recording of his presentation from Tuesday. But he provided like having like a tally mark pretty much where you're gonna keep track of, you know, who have you contacted on week one, week two, week three, and so on to make sure that all the students in the class have been, you know, um, approached in the discussion board or by replying, providing feedback. Uh, in the class, okay? So historically, uh, there's low diversity in STEM and geosciences specifically is the least diverse. Um, you can see this when you walk into the hallway of many uh, STEM departments, right? Uh, the pictures of directors and faculty on the walls through the years are mostly white male. So if you imagine when you have a student of color walking down the hallway, you know, looking for uh, support, looking for information about the department, they do not really see themselves represented in those fields. So representation in the classroom is key. Uh, we need to avoid using uh, stereotypical images and videos, include diverse authors and provide material from different uh, cult uh, cultural perspectives. Okay? Um, we need to help students understand that each other is unique and different, right? And that their views and perspectives are valued. Uh, that's, that's very important. Also building a community of care in the classroom can help reduce prejudice. So understand student needs and help them connect to the resources in the college and the community. Uh, we can post those resources in our uh, classes, right? Like in our LMS. <clears throat> I'm sorry, uh, hold on one second. <laughs> And we need to make sure that students uh, can view and can access those uh, resources. Uh, keep in mind, you know, as you're aware, we can have students from different <clears throat> states uh, or from even different countries, right? So we, we need to make sure that they are aware of the different resources uh, in the college and the community, specifically like food or uh, housing assistance, right? Uh, for those of you that would like to increase awareness of unconscious biases, you might want to consider taking some of the tests available online, like the Harvard University Project Implicit that is included on the slide. <clears throat> uh, in this case, the test uh, will you know, measure the attitudes and belief that people may be unwillingly or unable to report. Uh, the test might show that you have an implicit attitude that you didn't know about. Uh, so it is very useful. Oh, I see that, Alexandra, thank you so much for adding the, the link on, uh, in the chat. Also, Alexandra uh, shared on one of the Tuesday sections, the Yale University Awareness Implicit Biases uh, webpage. Uh, so that one is a very useful resource. It includes uh, examples and recommendations on self-assessing uh, implicit biases and how to cultivate inclusivity. Okay? So that one uh, is the, if you type in uh, search for Yale University Awareness Implicit Biases, that it will pop up. It's the first uh, page that you'll see li listed in there, okay? So there you have two different resources. <clears throat> okay, so now if we uh, go back into the Mentimeter, hopefully this time it is working. I did some uh, tweaking in the uh, before. Also, thank you, Alexandra, for posting uh, the link. Um, let's try this again. and <laughs> Let's try going into menti.com. And if you use the code, 
Um, and then you can, if you can rate these two statements, uh, it goes on the left from strongly disagree to the right to strongly agree. Uh, the first statement reads, I'm aware of my unconscious biases in my online classroom. And the second one, I was able to recognize my own biases uh, recently. Okay? I'm going to include also in the chat a direct link into the Mentimeter. Uh, keep in mind that this is completely anonymous. So when you vote and add your information here, Okay, now I think I send the email directly to Jamie. Now everyone should have the link and hopefully the link is working. So let me know if it is not working, just, uh, you know, take some time to uh, think about it and, you know, just answer those questions uh, based on what you think is the, would be the best fit just to, so we can create some, it's working. So thank you so much, Jamie. Uh, let's see, hopefully it will work for the next one. We have one more question with the Mentimeter tool. Um, so, Here we are. Can you all see, Jamie, please let me know in the chat or with your microphone. Can you see on the screen, here's uh, the vote from the group. We yes, can see okay, it, thanks, perfect. Raphael. <laughs> I had to jump in into the browser to see the results. Um, so here's, uh, so you can see something that, you know, we all have biases, right? So we, we need to be aware, that's the most important thing to think about it, uh, you know, take a look at different examples because we might be doing something that is, uh, that could be considered a bias for some students, right? We're always, our brains are built that way. We like to categorize everything pretty much, right? So we look for differences and we try to group everything. So we need to make sure that in the classroom, we're not using any of this, uh, unconscious biases, right? Because of course that will be a big barrier for uh, many students in our classroom. So thank you all of you that voted. Uh, let me jump back into Zoom. Oh, there you go. I saw the results. <laughs> so they're showing up now, that's good. So now we know that it's still working. So on the next, Slide. Give me one second because now I lost all of you here. Okay, so we are on the next slide. Uh, maintaining high academic standards. So uh, this is what Cassandra mentioned earlier today. Uh, holding the same high academic standards uh, for all students will help them, specifically those with lower grades and different backgrounds, uh, realize that they have the potential. Uh, abilities and capabilities to perform well in the course in their own way. Uh, guide them to use their strengths and improve their weaknesses to succeed. Uh, this is one of the reasons why providing, uh, providing timely and meaningful feedback is so important. Uh, so share your experience, your expectations uh, for the course and provide students with the resources and support they need. Uh, share those resources in your LMS. Uh, we can keep, uh, you know, high academic standards while still showing empathy and compassion for students, right? Um, you know, in some cases, you can see instructors, uh, you know, for, for X or Y reason, they will lower expectations for uh, a certain student because they think that they're helping that student, you know, pass the class or to feel better. But in, in reality, what you're doing is telling that student that, you know, they're not good enough to do what other students are doing, right? So we need to make sure that the standards remain uh, high for everyone, okay? So as part of the universal design for learners, it is important to provide different means of action and expression. Uh, this allows students to use the information that they already know with a foundation based on their values, experiences, and skills to combine it with the new information that is being presented to demonstrate mastery of the course content. So promoting the use of critical uh, thinking skills is key to maintaining high academic standards. Uh, I suggest combining textbook examples with examples that are more relevant to your student population. Uh, for example, in my groundwater lesson, uh, many uh, textbooks usually use uh, one a case study from the famous San Joaquin Valley in California, which is a fantastic example. However, in order to promote a deeper understanding and application of the content, I use local examples close to the college and ask students from other areas uh, or states to search for comparable examples near the places where they are located 
or a place of interest. Uh, so making the task relevant and aligned to the course objective allows students to feel motivated and feel more comfortable at a higher tier in the Bloom taxonomy. So uh, the other uh, you know, consideration is to provide low stake assignments or activities Accompany it with quick feedback to help students achieve understanding of the basic concepts necessary to meet the unit objective. So breaking down those high stakes items into low stake activities uh, could be uh, very helpful, okay? Doing this will help reduce that inherent pressure of working for just a grade and that sense of failure that can accompany a low score, right? So in addition, we can promote, uh, promote sorry, positive uh, self-talk uh, so when students see that you believe in them, they start believing in their capabilities and become ready for higher demands. Uh, you can try this by adding a positive reinforcement to feedback, say what was done correctly and what can be done to improve what they have completed. Um, the other one, a uh, misconception that students might have instead will make them feel unprepared and not good enough to achieve the high academic standards. So, uh, you know, address those misconceptions in any opportunity that you, that you might have. Uh, some examples, uh, you probably have heard this uh, in, you know, in your classroom, in that you need to be a straight A student to be on the, state, uh, on the STEM field, that it is gender specific, right? That's the other one. Or probably have heard from students if you're teaching math, like you know, the first day of class, oh, I'm never good for, you know, in math. Like I know that I'm gonna fail. So you need to, you know, take those students right from that moment and help them, you know, believe in themselves and, you know, show them the support they need to continue and work towards uh, achieving the learning outcomes in the course. Okay. So the next step um, is facilitating knowledge uh, during course delivery. Um, so providing roadmaps and objectives to our students ahead of time allows them to prepare for the type of work that they will be completing in the course. Uh, so create scaffolds for students to build their knowledge and skills and help them visualize the importance of all the content that they're learning and understand how it applies to their life. And this is uh, pretty much what Cassandra was mentioning before. So in other words, show your students how they will be using the information they have learned to comprehend the new information given and help them incorporate their own ideas and findings. So acknowledge the cultural diversity in the classroom and highlight those ideas and findings, right? That's one way to uh, promote that community. For example, in my, uh, in my course before the groundwater topic is discussed, uh, students learn about the different type of rocks, uh, their properties, the common uses. Uh, so the scaffolding of the previous knowledge combined with the student experiences in the subject area uh, can help students uh, understand how the local geology can potentially affect the quality of the groundwater in the region where they live, right? So they're, they're doing those connections as they go. Uh, in Wisconsin, more than 70% of the residents obtain their drinking water from the groundwater. And there's a, you know, there are reports of human-made and natural contaminants in the water. Uh, so helping students link this information to their life, like for example, getting clean, safe water at home can, can motivate students to be engaged in the class, share their experiences, and even become interested on the field, right? Or, or, or a related field. <clears throat> Uh, one strategy that we can use is to ask students in a private journal to reflect how the content intersects with their lifestyles or previous experiences, right? Especially at the beginning of the semester, some students might not be, you know, willing or open to, uh, you know, to trust and share some personal experience to the entire class. But if you do so in a private journal, then you can motivate those students to share those experiences with the rest of the group, right? Um, so we can facilitate knowledge in this lesson, for example, by providing resources for students to research the quality of water near their community or the place of interest, and then compare it to the Environmental Protection Agency standards. Uh, in many cases, this information is readily accessible online and open to the public, right? So there's no additional cost for getting these resources. Uh, so students discuss their findings with the rest of the group in a discussion forum objective, guided questions, prompts, and examples could be provided to have an effective uh, discussion. Uh, we can ask students to include a combination of facts to support their findings and to express their opinion and share experiences in the subject matter. 
So providing a balance between the, the two will help students build and use the knowledge to make it their own. Right. And this is something that we see a lot in the discussion boards, right? Students sometimes share their opinion, but they do not use, uh, you know, data or facts to, uh, to supplement what they're trying to express, right? So we need to kind of like help them use that information that they're learning connected with, with their experiences so that you have a meaningful uh, discussion. Okay. <clears throat> So there's uh, in the next uh, part of the model uh, is integrating diverse experiences into the course curriculum, right? Uh, and there are different ways that we can integrate those experiences into the curriculum. For example, uh, we can start by sharing our own personal experiences that relate to the course content, right? So that's something that usually, you know, we all do, right? In the online classroom, we may need to do it differently, right? Like doing a video, like an introduction for the lecture, we can include it, type it in as an announcement, but you know, we always try to do something like that. This helps humanize the online learning experience, right? Um, the use of local and diverse examples that are representative of the student population is key. Um, An online search can help you find articles, meetings, current events, activities that are happening locally that could be linked to the could be linked uh, to the course content. Uh, this way students can actively engage in the community and bring those experiences into the online classroom. Uh, so look for opportunities to have diverse uh, guest speakers or colleagues uh, to visit your class or even record a presentation. Nowadays, that's more common, right? They're not able to, to join the group, but yet they can record a short video presentation. Uh, there's graduate students, for example, conducting research, and they're usually willing to you know, express their experiences uh, with, with, with different groups in their community. This helps you know, students in your class to visualize themselves doing the type of work if they have some commonality with other people in the discipline. Um, so foster a sense of community uh, where students, students feel that they belong, right? Uh, so when students collaborate in the class discussion, remind them that each of them represents an individual, not an entire group based on race, ethnicity, or gender. Uh, we want students' identities to be welcome and value. Uh, this is a key component where we want to integrate their experiences into the learning environment. So integrating uh, diverse experiences in the classroom could be something like students discussing how a concept may be relevant to a person studying a different field than their own, like finances versus engineering. And this touches the point that uh, Cassandra mentioned. We have a lot of uh, adult uh, taking adult learners, right? They are returning. And they have a lot of those experiences that could be you know, connected with the information that we're building into our curriculum, right? Uh, so for example, in, in, in this case, for this lesson in specific, how is the concept of groundwater relevant to a student in nursing versus a student in engineering, right? So we can find some connection. I have had some students, adult uh, students that were you know, returning back to school after being in the construction area for many, many years. And they're in the classroom and they're like saying, okay, why do I care about groundwater if I'm going to study something different? And then, you know, I start, you know, talking with them like, well, when you were, were do, when you were doing construction, right, something that you had to deal with was with the groundwater level, right? And also with preventing contamination to getting contamination into some of the natural uh, areas. So, you know, something as simple like that, just to for the students to link the connection to some of those experiences will help them feel motivated. And usually you get like a very positive feedback after they have find those uh, connections, right? Um, <clears throat> so uh, we can talk, you know, as I mentioned, we can talk about the intersection between the content and the different field of study and integrate those students' experiences into the curriculum, okay? Uh, important, just remind your students uh, that, you know, the learning experiences, the learning experience itself is gonna be more beneficial when all of them uh, share their own perspective, right? When they're bringing something into the classroom. <clears throat> and the next point in this one will be calling uh, attention to social inequity in society. So in order to create the learning environment where all students feel welcome, we need to call social attention, uh, we, sorry, we need to call attention to social inequity in society. Uh, students affected by social inequity will know that you care about them, and those that might not be directly affected might use their voices to call out 
uh, some uh, of the social inequities that we see, right? Uh, for example, in my lesson, I could use some scenarios from the community uh, to show those inequities. Uh, historically, the quality of water in mid to low income areas is poor. Uh, this is at a national and international level, right? Something that happens pretty much everywhere. Uh, there's environmental uh, issues involving lead pipes, nitrates, uh, arsenic, and other contaminants in the water. Uh, recently, some students have expressed concern about the presence of nitrates and PFAs uh, in the groundwater in the city of Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, and PFA, if you have right here at the bottom of the presentation on the left, uh, is a per and polyfluoroalkyl, right? Very nicely to and easy to pronounce, right? As always, <laughs> some of those uh, chemical elements. So this is basically the material that is used uh, in nonstick pans, uh, water repellent products, firefighting foam, uh, and usually they do not break down in, in, in the environment. So they will go into the groundwater system and they will remain in there for a very long time. Uh, if we take a look at the map that is included on uh, the right corner of the of the slide, this is a portion of the eastern side of the city of Madison, and this is showing there's a few uh, red circles. Uh, some of them include some yellow that are larger than the rest. Right, those are utility wells that are providing groundwater to the city, and while there's no specific uh, level uh, EPA level for the PFA that could be, you know, uh, affecting the health of humans, there is a, a health advisory that was released in 2016 that is not enforceable, right? It's just a, an advisory, but it states that in areas where you have more than 70 parts per trillion, you need to take into consideration how good is that quality of the water. And in some areas, specifically this one right here in the northeastern section of Madison, this is very close. This is the well that uh, provides water, drinking water to the community that we serve. This is pretty much where our campus is. And you can see that the volume, the, the, the contamination right now is 55 parts per trillion. It's very close to that um, non-enforceable level. So students, you know, they have come with this observation to the class, right? So even before we, we talk about it, they already are bringing those. So it's a great way for them to find the connection to what they're doing and they can find those and how, you know, for example, how can I get, you know, clean drinking water for my home if that's the only source that I have, right? Uh, coming Water coming from uh, the utility wells. So in this case, students might be interested in finding way, ways to get involved or even to advocate for their communities by joining environmental groups uh, or even pursuing careers related to this situation. Um, so in the chat, if you had a, a chance, uh, let me know if you have any, if you're teaching a specific subject matter uh, and any opportunity that you can see for calling social inequity, right? So calling out social inequity. And I'll take this to the, uh, for a quick, uh, you know, few seconds of a break. So if you have a subject matter and you are using different techniques to call social inequity, uh, please share those with the group. <clears throat> Global goals as an anchor in statistics took a lot of issues. Available technology. That's one that was very, uh, you know, that we were looking uh, at the college also in terms of accessibility, right? Of uh, broadband uh, access for many of the students that were living into more brutal areas of the college. Neuroscience, where we discuss uh, the brain development, we talk about access to prenatal care and implications on brain for brain development. Great, thank you. <clears throat> so <clears throat> an important component of, and thank you so much everyone that have shared uh, in, in the chat, uh, so thank you. Uh, an important component of an effective online classroom is having a sense of community that fosters student to student and student to teacher collaboration. Uh, we need to humanize the learning experience, create a sense of, pre a sense of presence 
uh, and keep frequent personalized communication to learn about your students, their goals and expectations and showing empathy, right? Uh, often students of color are not aware of their place in the community. They do not feel value. So we need to make sure that they feel welcome and value in the online community and that their voices are heard. Okay. Uh, STEM courses uh, specifically can be very individualistic. For example, students are at time required to complete a reading and a quiz or an assignment with minimal interactions with their peer. Uh, for example, in the groundwater lesson, collaboration could be promoted by providing students with the opportunity to research groundwater data of a place of interest like their neighborhood and comparing that data with their peers. Uh, students discuss what might be causing the problem in the quality of the water, how to address that problem if there's a problem, and how they are impacted by this. Uh, they can link that information to the previous units, like the type of rocks in the area where they live. Um, so this can be used as a scaffold to groundwater movement um, that is part of the learning outcome. Uh, so provide means for students to collaborate online. So it could be in the form of a wiki, collaborative document, virtual meeting rooms, or open discussion board to ask questions. Uh, in those boards, students can share their availability and willingness to help other students uh, on specific subjects, uh, sorry, subjects or topics. Um, we can also include any student clubs, organization, forums, or events where students can engage with each other outside of the online classroom. Right? That's another way to build that community, right? providing other means for them to uh, collaborate. Uh, also, <clears throat> include news and articles relevant to the course content and the community. If you know that there's a student in your class, for example, that is from a different state or from a different country, and you're aware of an issue, like for example, in this case, uh, groundwater, like groundwater contamination in that location, or any other social inequity, uh, that's, a, you know, that's a, you know, an opportunity to include that information in the course so that the student could be kind of like feel part of the, of the community, right? So that there's integration. And then, so let me, we have one question. Oh, it's working. That's good. <laughs> These are probably the result from earlier. So if it is not working, let me know. And once again, this is a Mentimeter. I'm going to include, the direct link again in the chat. Um, so based on your experience, rank the following community building strategies, starting with the most effective. We have discussion board, uh, video apps, uh, such as Flipgrid, virtual meeting spaces, collaborative documents, it could be a wiki, OneDrive, Google Drive, uh, or gamification. And, Okay, let's, let's break the system and use the alternative. And so I'm using the browser now. So now we, I can go to the next page. Here we are. Is it working? Um, Yes, I see there's work, okay. <laughs> yes, yeah, so I see discussion board is Ryan, the first one. Yeah, I've seen an increase uh, in the use of uh, collaborative documents. Uh, in some of the LMS systems, uh, like in Blackboard, uh, with the Blackboard Ultra, they are no longer offering wikis. Uh, so, you know, a lot of faculty have been moving into using alternatives. So using either uh, Google or using uh, OneDrive, depending on, on your college, um, you, can, you can take a look at those. Uh, yeah, so Flipgrid in that case, uh, we also use UES, as I mentioned before. So students do have access to UES and they can create videos directly from their phone and they can post those videos or the link uh, in the LMS system. So it's another way. So there's uh, you know, multiple options for students to create different formats, right? And how to show their content. Yeah, 
Yeah, I agree. So yeah, uh, Chile included the one common technologies that require more bandwidth create access problem for some students. I 100% I agree. Uh, and that's something that, uh, you know, we need to keep in consideration to provide alternative formats, right? So provide as many choices as possible. Uh, not just to include a video, if there's a, an option for the student to type in their answer, that could be uh, very beneficial. Yeah, absolutely. Same thing with the videos that we include in our class, right? Sometimes they, they require a lot of bandwidth to download those videos. So if we can provide a transcript and provide like an alternative way for students to receive the same information, um, that's super helpful. Yeah, so thank you everyone. Uh, I'm gonna go back into presentation real quick here. And okay, I found everyone here. Okay. <laughs> okay, so the um we have two more uh, slides of so technology in this case, uh, and this is uh, you know touching some of the comments in the in the chat as well. So this is a great segue. Uh, so technology can improve the student learning experience by providing easy access to information, flexibility for students to explore different subjects and research uh, more difficult concepts. Uh, there's a lot of positive outcomes uh, on using technology in the classroom but we need to be thoughtful on how we integrate technologies in ways that are equitable and inclusive. Uh, there's a gap between people of color, access to technology and digital literacy, which contributes to an even larger gap in STEM specifically. Um, so at the institutional level, we need to look for options to make technology accessible uh, to all students. Uh, and to provide the required support, this is very important, this is the required support for each of those tools. Uh, for example, I wanted to share this, uh, our college, Madison College, recently created a program where laptops, internet hotspots, and other technology tools are loaned to students at no charge. Uh, the library and technology services, they have an extensive support system, uh, but always, you know, as anything like that, sometimes students do not, do not know where do, I need, do they need to go? So it's very important that us as faculty, we're the front line. So we need to share those resources with students, right? Make them available in our LMS as announcement and send reminders, frequent reminders. So if there's a new tool that you're using in your, in your class, start by having like a low impact activities paired with the tool so that students become familiar and then you can build from there, right? So that students uh, you know, understand what they need to do and how to uh, incorporate the technology. Um, so, <clears throat> uh, as part of the content in, in this lesson, uh, specifically of Brown Water, uh, students are provided different means of representation, including videos, animations, a groundwater model, and access to different websites that are relevant to the content. So integrating the technology can allow students the opportunity to create and share content to express what they know. Uh, a colleague in the criminal uh, justice department allows students to write songs in order to demonstrate their understanding of concepts. Another colleague allows students to create podcasts. Uh, the idea is that students are given the opportunity to create something to make the learning experience more uh, personal and relatable, right? Uh, in some classroom settings, you have a large number of students. So getting to know their culture, their lifestyle, the interests, their values might be challenging. So offering choices with general objective uh, specific guidelines and goals for the projects or assignments will let the students demonstrate their knowledge in their own way, right? So they can have multiple choices. So by using different means of actions and expressions, students can integrate their unique experiences and knowledge into the course content. The key is that students exchange knowledge with their classmates and show mastery of the content. Yeah. And then we are going into the last, um, and then Cassandra will wrap up uh, with a conclusion and then we'll take a, a look at, uh, at your questions. Yes, well, thanks Rafael. So to conclude here about our CROTM model, um, it puts into practice the power of being seen by students. And I would like to leave you with a greeting from the Zulu people of South Africa. And their greeting here is I am here to be seen and I see you. Our students, want, our students want us to acknowledge 
who they are, and also where they are in the learning process. Also, our model considers culture a social currency. Each and every student that walks into your online classroom brings with them some kind of cultural knowledge, experiences that you can use to help them understand the material, but also they can help their classmates understand the course material as well. Our model encourages active learning and interactional transaction in the classroom. What, um, what you want to discourage um, as much as you can um, is what I call the invisible student. And that's the student who feels that, well, what I have to say, it doesn't matter, or I am not going to participate in this um, in this activity because other students have more knowledge than I do, or they seem to understand the material um, better than I do. Now, there are some students in our, in our classes and they are great, um, they have um, great verbal acuity, but it doesn't ne necessarily mean that that student who might be um, you know, and um, right now I am um, teaching at a college and, and there are a significant number of undocumented students. And I've noticed at time that my undocumented students, um, they can be rather quiet in the classroom because they are, um, because, because they feel that their experiences do not relate to the, uh, do not relate to the American experience. And guess what? I don't want it to. I, um, sometimes the most useful conversations in how we learn is when we bring other international cultures into the classroom and use that as an opportunity to explore, innovate, and talk. Um, you know, so we want to increase interactional transaction in the classroom. The model promotes the student's social construction of knowledge. Um, you're giving students the burden, or I should say the responsibility of, of, learning, of learning the material. All of the knowledge does not have to flow directly from the instructor. The, the student can also be responsible for creating knowledge and gaining knowledge from other sources as well. The model facilitates discussions about social inequality in society. And students are able to share their experiences um, regarding social inequality and how it relates to the material that they're learning in your online classroom. But most importantly, we're using technology, not for the sake of using technology, but technology used judiciously can show students how it can be a source of lifelong learning. And that learning um, is a continuous process and they can incorporate that um, um, in, in their experience moving forward. Okay. Raphael, next slide. All right, um, here's our um, works cited sources. And um, we will provide a copy of our presentation um, to Alexandra and you, you will ha have these sources available if there's something you would like to um, search on your own.
Thank you, Raphael and Cassandra. There were a couple of questions that I, if I could call your attention to them, it was when you were discussing um, unconscious bias mm -hmm. in, in we did the Mentimeter. And so there were a couple of questions, Matt, Alex, and, and Tom uh, all asked, um, do you find that folks are not aware as aware as they think they are when, they, when self-reflecting on that question? And um, if the bias is unconscious, how do I realize that I have the bias in the first place? How do we actually know if it is manifesting into bias behavior? Yes, um, actually, um, Jamie, I noted that question. I wrote it down because I really wanted to answer it. And um, um, what I can uh, say to Matt is that one way you can, um, because we, we all have a blind spot and we are not aware of our, and we're not aware of our biases. And something that you can do is invite a colleague, someone into your classroom and have them conduct a peer review or a peer assessment of perhaps um, one of your, your lessons or, um, or perhaps an assignment and, and hear them out, ask them, um, what do you see here? What, um, you, know, when, you know, when students read um, the module, the, um, you know, the, um, the course module, um, you know, what are, you know, what impressions are the students walking away with? And if you can find that colleague who's really willing to provide what I call a warm critique <laughs> for you, um, I, I, um, I think that would be wonderful. I do have someone who serves in that role for me. And, um, and so I invite you to try and find someone to do that for you as well. Um, Raphael, did you have anything to add? Yeah, I was gonna say the same thing. That's, I think that's the best way to get someone, uh, you know, unusually someone from, even from a different department, right? That has nothing to do with the subject. So that way they have like an, you know, an open perspective of what students are getting, right? That first impression is, is very important. Um, and the other thing is, having an individual self-reflection. So while you're, uh, you know, in the classroom, uh, kind of like similar to what Kelly, uh, Dr. Kelly mentioned in, the, in his presentation, uh, when you're having a presentation and you're replying to emails or you're calling out students in the classroom, kind of like keep in mind whether you're calling, and this would be kind of like a only, you know, uh, a bimodal system, right? What do you think it would be male versus female? I know this is very, you know, a, a bimodal, but what you, what will be your first to go place where you're answering questions, right? That could be one self-reflection. Uh, you might not be aware that you're, you know, specifically just calling out like, you know, males in the classroom or females in the classroom, right? Or do you have a specific race that you're excluding, right? That you're not including, or maybe there's a student, uh, and this is something that some faculty have, uh, have, have shared that, Sometimes there are students from specific uh, from specific race that you know they're good on, on a specific subject, and they're unintentionally calling out that student. So what the other students see is basically a bias, right? That you're just addressing that particular student. So I think a self awareness, um, looking at examples, uh, I think that's very important because there might be things that you're doing that you are not even aware that you're doing them, right? So reading about those examples will give you cues to see what you need to look for when you are uh, showing uh, your presentation. Same, you know, same goes for the type of material that you're the example that you're impl uh, including in class, right? Uh, if you're using like a TV show or a movie or something, right? Make sure that those are, we have students from different backgrounds or different countries, right? So make sure that you use something that has the same meaning. If you cannot find something that will work for that, then make sure that you provide an explanation of what, what you're trying to present with those examples, right? That sometimes we, we forget to do. <laughs> same thing that would be, uh, that, that, that's all that I wanted to add, so thank you. I like the example that Kevin Kelly gave of when he became aware of it, he actually did a spreadsheet to try and track it. 
And you could do it, he did it to see who he was responding to in class and what the, you know, what that could tell him, but you could do it, you could adapt it for a number of, of things to try and understand um, your own unconscious biases. I really, I think that we've um, addressed all the questions in the chat. If, if we've missed something, please feel free to, to let me know. A lot of the, the chat was people sharing great resources and links, and, and mm -hmm. um, I really appreciate that. If, if anybody has any other questions, please let me know. Otherwise, we are at time where we're past time, and I want to be respectful of everybody's time today, particularly Cassandra and Raphael, who have put on such a great presentation for us today. I want to thank you and uh, thank Alex for uh, putting on this, this great um, conference this week and for this topic in particular. So, All right, with that, I think we can stop the recording. Thank you, Jamie.